and deal with the African origins of civilization. Um, and he's going to be one of the presenters at the conference. So we'll be joined by him in just a minute. Uh, we're broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, the African history network, the African history network and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. So you can follow us there. Also turn on live notifications. So, you know, when we go live, welcome to the African history network show. It is Thursday, April 21st, 2022. And we are live. Call numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Today is also the sixth anniversary of the passing of the one and only Prince, who uh Prince Rogers Nelson, who passed away on April 21st, 2016. And the whole world was stunned. So I, I did some postings on our Facebook fan page today, the African History Network, um, as well, commemorating the sixth anniversary of the passing of Prince. All right. Uh, so we're, we're going to talk uh, to Jabari here in just a second. Let me know when we have him on the line, Shakita. And then also uh, we're going to squeeze in this other story here that I, I haven't been able to really get to the past couple of days. So a lot of people know that a, a federal judge overturned the um, a federal judge struck down the uh, policy from the CDC to uh, extend the uh, mask mandate on planes and trains and transit systems, et cetera. OK, this was a federal judge that Donald Trump nominated. Uh, and she was deemed unfit to be a federal judge by the by the uh, I think it was the American Bar Association. She was deemed unfit to be a federal judge. OK, she's 33 years old, lifetime appointment. Uh, she was an associate attorney and she had never tried a case. And she's making a ruling that impacts the lives of millions of people. U.S. District Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell for the middle district of Florida ruled that the travel mask mandate was quote, was unlawful arguing that the CDC had overstepped its legal authority by imposing the mandate in February, 2021. And her ruling was ridiculous. Uh, it came out today that the department of justice is going to appeal. We'll talk some about this as well. Okay. Uh, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct your own behavior, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do it, teach what it doesn't know. Uh, we'll give you some more information about the uh, One Africa Power and Unity Conference. We have the information up at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Also, we'll let you know about our new online class uh, that starts up uh, on Saturday, April 23rd, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what it didn't teach you in school. Okay, do we have Jabari on the line? Uh, now, Jabari Osazi um, has said, uh, you, 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 uh, you'll see him in uh, the documentary Hidden Colors 5, and I've talked to Jabari. We've met uh, in person uh, previously at one of the conferences. I can't remember which one. Um, he's a brilliant brother, brilliant historian, and we're going to talk some about the um, African origins of civilization, which is... Uh, going to be his presentation um, at the One Africa Power and Unity Conference, okay? All right, so let me pull this up here. All right. So uh, Jabari Osazi has studied um, ancient Africa for over 30 years, focusing primarily on uh, ancient Kemet uh, or Egypt, uh, Focusing primarily on ancient uh, ancient Kemet, uh, ancient Egyptian history and spirituality, ancient Egyptian history and spirituality. Uh, Brother Osazi has led 
uh, annual study uh, tours to Egypt since 2002 in partnership. Uh, the Brother Osazi has led annual uh, study tours uh, to Egypt since uh, 2002 in partnership with African Genesis Institute. He has toured Egypt over 20 times, uh, more than 3,000 people seeking to uncover the wisdom and accomplishments of uh, ancient Africans have taken these epic journeys. He has also led uh, study tours to other, area, to other areas in Africa, including Ethiopia and Ghana, okay? Uh, we're gonna get him on in just a few minutes. We're having a uh, problem getting him on. I know he's traveling right now. Uh, he's on the road. Uh, so we'll get him, get him on here in just a minute. Okay, now, um, his, pop, his popular monthly historical museum tours have included the world-renowned Egyptian and African collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Museum, the University of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the University of Pennsylvania Museum uh, of Archaeology and Anthrop Anthropology, the uh, Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago, and the Museum of Fine Arts um, in Boston, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Okay, and just a second here, let me check something here. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see here. All right. I'm, I'm about to send this to you again, Shakita. Uh, hold on just a second. Okay, I'm about to send this to you again. All right, so the call in number is 313-778-7600 is the call in the number if you have a question or comment um, as well during, uh, during this discussion. Now, the One Africa Power and Unity Conference is taking place uh, we have the information on our website also. It's taking place uh, Saturday, uh, April 30th, and uh, Sunday, May 1st, at the Double Tree Hotel. Okay. And I'll be there as well. I'll be a vendor. I may be on one of the panel discussions. Dr. Leonard Jeffries uh, will be there. Uh, he'll be speaking. Uh, uh, Professor Jane Small, uh, Asar M. Hotep, uh, uh, M. Fudishi Jehutamas. Uh, they'll all they'll all be there. Uh, Professor Kaba Kamene is doing a presentation also. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanNetwork.com. If you can't attend in person, you can, um, uh, they have a ticket where you can live stream the entire conference also, okay? Now, while we wait to get uh, Jabari on the line, uh, today is the uh, sixth anniversary of the death of the one and only Prince, okay? Also, the day is the anniversary of the uh, passing of Nina Simone, Nina Simone. So I, I, I shared a post on our Facebook page, the African History Network, that I picked up from um, that I picked up from uh, Daily, uh, Daily Black Facts. Uh, Nina Simone passed away in uh, 2003. OK, 2003, the uh, singer Nina Simone. Um, she died peacefully at her home in France. She was 70 years old. Nina Simone passed away April 21st, 2003. And then also we know that uh, Prince passed away uh, in 2016, April 21st also. So I was listening to uh, my friend Reese Colbert, who is a uh, we're uh, co-panelists on uh, we're panelists uh, on uh, weekly panelists on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, she's on on Thursdays. She actually guest hosted today because Roland's traveling. I'm on Fridays. Okay, so I'll be on tomorrow. Um, Reese Colbert was uh, guest hosting the Clay Kane show today, and uh, and uh, there was an interview done with Apollonia. So many of us remember Apollonia. I had a poster of Apollonia six on my wall when I was a kid in, in I was in middle school. I remember when purple rain came out in 1984. Um, I had, I had the bandy six album also came out in 1981. I don't know where my albums are. I still have my cassette tapes. I don't know where my albums are. 
because I had um, I had uh, Vanity Six, you know, I had the 1999 uh, double LP of Prince, all that. But I found out today in this interview, and we'll bring Jabari on in just a second. You you can put up, you can bring him on. Um, I, I found out today that Apollonia co-wrote the Glamorous Life that was Sheila E's debut song, okay? She co-wrote that song. I didn't know that, okay? I found that out today. I also found out that, I, 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 you know, when Apollonia came out, you know, a lot of us thought, okay, she's a light-skinned black girl. She's actually Mexican. She's not African-American at all. She's actually Mexican. So I found this out in this interview today. But, you know, we all miss Prince. He passed away April 21st, 2016. He was 57 years old. So uh, check out our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. We have some posts there dealing with Prince. And uh, there was one, uh, I got it. There's a video that uh, Sheila E shared. I share, I follow Sheila E on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, I got to share this video of Prince performing that Sheila E shared. Okay, uh, we've got uh, Jabari. Uh, Hotel Jabari Osazi. How you doing today, brother? Okay, do we have Jabari? On? Ron had a tax problem. He right. just couldn't right, handle on his own. We're going to commercial break. All right, stand by. We'll, we'll be back with uh, Jabari in just a minute. Listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. Back from breaking four minutes. Back from breaking three minutes. Back from break in two minutes, everybody. Stand by. All right. You can still register for the uh, online history class I teach on Saturdays and Sundays. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And then on Sundays, I teach from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Back from breaking one minute, stand by. What shall we do with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more? Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. There was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. There's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 19 a.m. Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right, right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Thursday, April 21st, 2022, and we are live. 
uh we have a new session a new section of um ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school starting up on saturday april 23rd uh 2022 so visit our website uh africanhistorynetwork.com you can register for that 10-week online course we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place class is regularly 130 dollars on sale 80 dollars uh, even after the course is over with, you can, you'll can you still have access to the full class. You can go back and watch the full course, okay? So visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, that class is 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay, uh, do we have Jabari on the line? All right, uh, I just uh, texted Jabari, so uh, we should be getting him on the line right now. Um, and this sunday on the sunday show we should have uh dr leonard jeffries back on um as well as uh professor james small we're going to have uh taki grant uh who's the executive producer of the film uh, uh hapi and we'll also have sister felicia on uh as well so we're going to have a jam-packed show um this uh sunday okay now sundays we're on two hours earlier we're on sundays 9 p.m to 11 p.m uh, Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. Okay, so uh, look out for the uh, show Sunday. Okay, while we wait on uh, uh, Brother Jabari to come on, um, I want to go to this. Um, I want to go to this second story here. Um, there was a there was a uh, article I posted twice. It's on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. This deals with the Bank of England uh, revealing uh, that they owned almost 600 slaves, okay? And let me find this one here. Um, th this is an article from uh, the Daily Mail. Bank of England discovers it owned 599 slaves in Grenada in the 1770s, okay? Claiming it was never directly in uh claiming it was never directly involved in the uh slave trade okay so this was a, a new development and uh, check out this article here from um uh the daily mail now this piece came out uh april 15th april 15th 2022 uh from the daily mail and when it when, it, when the article came out i posted posted it then on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Uh, but I, I reposted it again today. So check this one out. Bank of England discovers it owned 599 slaves in Grenada in the 1770s after claiming it was never directly involved in the, in the slave trade. Put, put your bar on, please. The Bank of England owned 599 slaves when it bought two plantations in, seven, in the 1770s. The revelation came to light in research after the 2020 Black Lives Matter protest. A new exhibition showcases the bank's links to slavery as it acknowledges uh, the past. Okay, so we want to welcome uh, to the African History Network show for the first time, uh, Jabari Osazi. Hope to have brother. How you doing today? How are you? Oh, I'm all right, man. I'm all right. I know. Can you uh, hear me? Hope that. Yeah, I'm, I can hear you. I can hear you, brother. All right. I know you were traveling when I talked to you about 45 minutes ago, man. I know you're on the road, so hopefully you're stationary by now. Yeah. Okay. I am stationary. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, you you, uh, you are one of the uh, esteemed presenters who are going to be uh, here in Detroit for the One Africa Power and Unity Conference coming up April 30th and uh, Saturday, April 30th and, and uh, Sunday, uh, May 1st. And your presentation is on the um, African origins of civilization, and you talk about you, you talk about the link to uh, Dr. Shankar the Joke or Dia. Uh, so, give us a synopsis of what you're going to talk about. Yes. Well, first, let me say peace to your entire audience, to the family. Oh, thank um, you. I, I have. 
uh, really uh, been, uh, it's my honor to be here because I know the important work that our dear brother Michael Inhofeck has been doing for such a long period of time. So oh, thanks. I, I'm really honored to be here. I, I'm going to say that um, one of the most important individuals that our community has spawned, that our nation, that our people has spawned, is the incredible ancestor, Dr. Sheikh Hunter Gio. Yes. And his monumental work the African origin of civilization is really the, the, the synthesis for the presentation I'll be doing. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to come to Detroit and do this presentation that will really look at um, the African legacy from two different vantage points. First, we're going to tell the story that some folks might be familiar with, the story of how Africans actually peopled the world. Okay. And as we tell that story, Brother Michael, we're going to actually talk a bit about um, those Europeans that attempted to um, misrepresent the reality that, that every person on the planet is the descendant of an African mother. Okay. Um, and, then, um, and then the second half, we're going to go into the part that is even more controversial and less known. We're going to talk about how Africans gave civilization, not just humanity in terms of the very DNA, but also the civilization will be the second part. How did Africans give all of the most important aspects of modern society to the world? Mathematics, science, architecture, engineering, and of course, yes, spirituality. Right. And so it's a two-part lecture, and um, I, I'm really, really excited that I'll get a chance to bring it to the Detroit family. Okay, so so let's let's look at this a little bit here. Um, so when you talk about mm -hmm. when you talk about African, uh, so how far back are you going in the history, and do you deal with the African, the ancient African presence in the Americas at all? Either we know our brother Dr. David M. Hotep is act. He has two books out now. The first one, the first Americans were Africans, mm -hmm. documented evidence, came out in two thousand ten. And his second one, the first Americans were Africans uh, re revised, came out, uh, I think it was late last year. So how f do you deal with the African presence in the Americas at all, the ancient African presence? Just curious. Uh, to be very honest, I, I, I simply touch on it briefly. Okay. Um, I, know the, the, um, <laughs> I know there's a lot to cover in the workshop. I know there's a lot to cover in the workshop. There's a whole lot to cover. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I think that... Um, we, we really do need to talk more about how Africans peopled the world, because mm -hmm. that is certainly um, a really important topic. I, I often say to my students that if people are anywhere, it's because Africans went there. Right. Um, and so I really, it is of critical importance for us to acknowledge just how far and wide Africans journey. But this particular lecture mm -hmm. will really start several million years ago. It'll, it'll okay. talk about Bink Nesh, that the yeah. Europeans talk, uh, called Lucy. Right. We'll talk about Argy, and we'll come forward. We'll talk about those um, those those beings that were early human um, uh, recent descendants, not necessarily the Homo sapiens sapiens, but then we'll come forward into Homo sapiens sapiens because one of the things that we realize that some of those Europeans, and I wish you could see my air quotes, but in all that, <laughs> scholars <laughs> right. uh, did, Right. did is that they tried to say that yes africans were the first people on the planet but we were primitive mm -hmm. and so that's part of what what um we do those they western tried to scholars their own separate um pristine origin in fact even when we use the word caucasian mm -hmm. we are referencing the idea that the european is actually the 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 primary human being and that the quote unquote African and quote unquote Oriental actually devolved from them. Mm -hmm. We think that we're being polite by calling people Caucasian. In actuality, that term should be removed from our lexicon. Yeah, well, and so we're really mm -hmm. going to go ahead. I'm sorry, brother. Go ahead. Go, go, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I, I think that we really need to um, talk about how the science was developed, how we began to understand exactly how Africans were the world's first people. Um, and so that's part of the discussion we'll have. And we'll even touch on some of those racist European scholars 
who actually attempted to misrepresent the story, who attempted to try to describe Africans as primitive, as, as similar to the orangutan, one says. Right. Um, and so we'll, we'll go through that before we explode into exactly how advanced ancient African civilizations actually were. Okay. All right. And that was um, uh, 1770, 1779, Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who coined the term Caucasian. That's right. Yeah, uh, exactly. That's right. That's yeah. right. That's right. And he, he's, he was one of the ones you, you, who... You know how it, Go ahead. Go ahead. You, you know how it is when you're talking with your peers, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I yep. can't wait to see you, brother. I've only, I've only met you once. Exactly. It's going to be a lot of fun to actually talk about some of these topics. Exactly. Exactly. Well, look, we're coming up here on the break. When we come back from the break, I want you to explain the forgery called the Piltdown Man and uh, give us some more yes. of this information talking about the African origins of civilization when we come back. Stand by. Okay, everybody, listen to the African History Network hey, show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We're speaking with historian and educator and comedic priest Jabari Osazi. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. Okay, stand by, everybody. Back from break in four minutes. Stand by. Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. The uh, One Africa Power and Unity Conference is taking place uh, April 30th and May 1st right here in Detroit. If you can't make it, you can stream it from around the world. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information there. And then also... Um, also, you can uh, we're going to post a link here again uh, for you as well. Uh, you can register there also. Uh, you can uh, come attend in person or you can live stream from around the world. So let me go to this here. Back from break in three minutes. Back from break in uh, two minutes. Stand by. Okay, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Stand by. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills. Back from breaking one minute. Back from breaking one minute. Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. All right. Uh, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, we have the information on the homepage of our website, African History Network.com. This is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. 
When you go to it, it says Michael shows my picture there. These other ones here are fake African History Network cash app accounts. Uh, uh, and I have uh, made, I was actually able to make contact with cash app. They launched an investigation. I think it was three days ago into these fake African History Network cash app accounts. Okay. So I'm trying to get them shut down because they've been stealing money from us. And then also uh, the yellow uh, PayPal uh, donate button. And we have information about the uh, uh, One Africa Power and Unity Conference and our online course that's 10 week online course that starts up Saturday, April 23rd, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. All right, we wanna welcome uh, back uh, back to the show, uh, Jabari Osazi. Okay, so Jabari, uh, right before the break, you were giving us a synopsis of what you're gonna talk about in your uh, workshop at the conference. And uh, you were talking about Dignesh, uh, which means uh, you are amazing. Yeah. And it was uh, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen that named her Dinknesh. We know the Europeans called her Lucy. Uh, the archaeological team mm -hmm. was listening to the song uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds by the Beatles. They called her Lucy. Dr. Ben said, Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinen said that she's an African woman. She must have an African name. So he named her Dinknesh. Um, so talk mm -hmm. about uh, talk about Piltdown Man, which was a forgery. Uh, an archaeological forgery. Talk about that for a minute, please. Brother, Brother Michael, I'm going to tell you that this case is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. and, and in many ways, it actually demonstrates how far individuals will go to misrepresent the history of the world and the role that Africans played in it. It, yes. it is absolutely fascinating. Well, uh, just understand that we're talking about the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. This is when this occurred. This is before... DNA has come into its own as a scientific uh, a tool to be used to tell the story of humanity. And so in, uh, we should know that in 1912, two scholars, air quotes again, mm -hmm. Charles Dawson and um, Arthur Smith Woodward, actually came forward to, uh, uh, to report that they had found the quote-unquote missing link. They had found an early ancestor to Homo sapiens sapiens, the modern human being, right. in the area of Piltdown around England. And the argument they were making was that this fossil proved that in Europe, modern humans actually developed. That this fossil showed that this being had a large cranial um, uh, capacity. So... This was a thinking being, but before, but existed before Homo sapiens sapiens. They were trying to argue that Europeans had, in many ways, a separate origin. That yes, primitive humans might have come from Africa, but that in actuality, modern humans were actually um, Europeans. And, and the thing that I think is so interesting is that um, for literally 40 years, 40 years, it seems that it was the, 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 the um, it really was the standard that everyone actually responded to. It was a medical textbook, geology textbook. We should know that both of these uh, men were represented very, very heavily in, in, um, at the British Museum, at um, the British Royal College of Surgeons. These were folks that had uh, credentials that could not be matched. Right. But we know now that they were lying, that they had created a forgery so that they could pretend that Europeans were something different, something more advanced than their African ancestors. Okay. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Now, mm -hmm. in, in your presentation, mm -hmm. in, in, in your intro uh, on today's show, you talked about... Um, uh, ancient Africans who gave humanity the most important aspects of modern so modern society: science, literature, mathematics, mm -hmm. architecture, and spirituality. If we look, for instance, at spirituality, because this is an interesting time of the year. We just had Easter, right? Easter, Easter, mm -hmm. Star. We just we just had that, and then every year, you know, around Easter, they show the Ten Commandments movie, okay, with uh, Charlton Heston and Yul Brenner. And you got these Europeans uh, taking the identities of, of African people. They have Yul Brenner as Ram Ramesses, 
and, and they have uh i forgot the white woman that played uh nefertari okay in ancient egypt mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. but talk about what africa gave to the world when it comes to spirituality because so many of us have been taught to hate africa part of it has to do with that That's right. part of it has to do with the 10 commandments and the exodus story and all that stuff but talk about what africa gave to the world as far as spirituality uh, this is a really important question uh brother michael because africans uh who were enslaved in in so many places around the world and were dealing with the, the scourge of colonialism on the continent uh, have destroyed their chains. We destroyed our chains. We are no longer slave people. But I think that one of the things that we must seriously uh, 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 um, analyze is whether we're truly free spiritually. This is a controversial topic, yes. Brother Michael. Mm -hmm. The reality is that our, for many of us, our understanding of how spirituality came into existence, our understanding of the critical narrative that puts forward Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is is, is one that is not um, supported by archaeology, not supported by textual uh, review. The reality is that Africans, particularly those Africans in the Nile Valley, the Hopi Valley region, mm -hmm. okay. actually put forward the concept that would become Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Right. And I'm going to tell you, Brother Michael, when I say this, this is when folks like you and I, I'm talking about our people, mm -hmm. come on the attack. Yes. And that's the part that is absolutely surprising and amazing. I'm no longer surprised, but I, I certainly was at one point that I <laughs> thought that what we were doing is we were trying to explain our place in the, in the, the, the creation of modern spiritual institutions. But in many instances, we are completely comfortable at taking a back seat to understanding how spirituality was given to the world. It's so interesting that you mentioned Easter and, and um, the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. The Ten Commandments is one of the most watched television programs in the world every year. Yep. Yep. And all it does is misrepresent who the comedic people were mm -hmm. and what their role was. And the thing that is also controversial, Brother Michael, is that the, the, the Exodus story is a mythological story. We know yep. now, and this is <laughs> biblical scholars that have come to this conclusion, Brother exactly. Michael. Exactly. The Exodus, <laughs> the sojourn in Kemet, the wilderness wanderings, those things are literary devices. They did not occur. So, so talk and about so, talk um, about literary is, devices. Is, talk about literary please. devices. Talk about that because so many of our people have been taught to take the Bible literally, and the and the Bible is and written in about eighty percent of the Bible is written in allegory, hyperbole, metaphor, and mm -hmm. parables. Okay, so talk about literal devices. Explain that, please. One of the things that we see occur um, is that the Bible and even the Torah, the earlier Jewish texts, mm -hmm. have borrowed heavily from other texts that existed in the, the area of the Mediterranean that Europeans would like to call the Near East. Right. I, of course, I don't call it the Near East or the Middle East because I don't think that I should carve up the world based on where Europeans live. Right. And that's one of the reasons why those terms exist. But understand that as we look at the story of the Exodus, we recognize that there are numerous anachronisms, things that could not have occurred at the time period <laughs> that we've been given. I mean, one of the simplest things that I say to people, Brother Michael, is, you know, every king, virtually every king in ancient Kemetic history had at least five names, mm -hmm. but the, the biblical narrative doesn't give us one. Exactly. That, right off the bat, that should be a red flag. Pharaoh is not a name, right that's a title. Bat, Fair, okay, let me, yes, let me just, just, just right. let me just do my disclaimer right quick, Jabari. And we're coming up on a break in three minutes. <laughs> what we may say go may may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you disagree with it or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what we're talking about. Pharaoh is a title. That's, right. That's not a name. Okay, I know you got I know you got a comedian mm. named Jay Pharaoh. But back at this time, this was supposed to happen. Pharaoh was a title. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so right. so when you read about Pharaoh, 
is like which pharaoh? <laughs> mm-hmm. 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 And then also we we recognize that the biblical narrative says that six hundred thousand, approximately six hundred thousand men left. Mm-hmm. Six hundred thousand. That doesn't include, it doesn't number their wives or their children. Right. Most scholars would say that say that there would have to have been approximately two million. Exactly. People. That's what I've been talking and about the past few days. Say, at that time, <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, it, it, Go ahead. My, and, and Brother Michael, that might have been about 25% of the population in Senate. Can you imagine if 25% mm-hmm. of the people of the United States just up and left at one time, what would occur? Okay. So there so, would be no way. <laughs> <laughs> to not have this story, this historical story recorded. Exactly. There are lots of problems with the mouth. Okay, so let's do this very quickly. We're coming up on the break. So I've been talking, a Sunday, I did a two hour presentation dealing with the Easter origins, pagan traditions, all this stuff. And one of the pieces of evidence mm. I cited was this article here from history.com. History.com's official website of the History Channel is called Passover. They go through and they talk about. The, what what the Bible says about Passover, all that stuff, and the and the killing of the firstborn African child, all that stuff, talking about murdering African children. But then they have a section called Questions of Historical Accuracy. Okay, and in this section it says it says for centuries scholars have been debating the details and historical merit of the events commemorating commemorated during the Passover holiday. Okay. Uh, it says, let's see her, mm. right here. Okay. He says, uh, despite numerous attempts, historians and archaeologists have failed to corroborate the tale of the Jews enslavement in and mass exodus from Egypt. We're coming up on the break, Jabari. We're going to continue this on the, we'll continue this on the other side of the break and get deeper into this. Cause, but, but wait, there's more. We'll talk about this on the other side of the break. You listen to the African history network show on Michael M hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. This is what I've been saying. There would have been about 2 million people exiting out of Egypt, out of Kemet. They were, it, they, it, it, according to the Bible, it says they wandered in the wilderness, in, in, the, in, the, in the desert for 40 years. What did they eat in the desert for 40 years? Where did they get water for 40 years for 2 million people? Stand by bathroom break in four minutes. These are good questions to ask your pastor on Sunday. And <laughs> ask your minister, ask your pastor on Sunday. Say, wait a second, hold on. <laughs> pastor, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I'm not trying to start a fight, but I'm just saying it's like, wait a second. Okay. If it, if, if it's mythology, say it's mythology, but don't pass off mythology as literal history. Then you run into a huge problem. Stand by back from breaking three minutes. Bathroom break in one minute.
Welcome back to the African History Network show. All right. Uh, we're speaking with uh, historian and educator and comedic priest, uh, Jabari Osazi. And right before the break, uh, I was talking about uh, an article that I cited in my presentation that I did on um, Sunday, uh, April 17th, Easter Sunday. And this deals with uh, Passover. We're talking about Easter. This deals with Passover. And it talks about the historical accuracy or lack of historical accuracy of the Exodus story. OK. Uh, and then it also goes on to say, Jabari, and I'm going to let you comment on this as well. It also goes on to say, although mm -hmm. the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Kemetic people kept feral records, no mention is made of an Israelite community within their midst or any calamities resembling the 10 biblical plagues. There is also no evidence of large encampments in the Sinai Peninsula, the fabled site of the Jews wandering or any sudden fluctuation in Israel's archaeological record that would indicate the departure and then return of a large population. Not to mention, what did they eat? They were supposed to be in, in the desert for 40 years. So what did 2 million people eat in the desert for 40 years? And where did they get water from for 40 years, 2 million people in the desert? Go ahead, brother. Well, brother, the other thing is they, they actually decided to take all their garbage with them. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, folks have been looking for this for literally the last 200 years and they found nothing. You know, I, I often use a very simple quote by a biblical scholar by the name of Louis Halpern. It's a controversial quote. He says, the actual evidence concerning the Exodus resembles the evidence for the unicorn. Okay, repeat that scholar. again. Repeat that again. <laughs> so he says, the actual evidence concerning the Exodus resembles the evidence for the unicorn. Okay. <laughs> this is Baruch Halpern. Halpern. Okay. So he actually wants us to understand that we don't have archaeological evidence. Mm -hmm. We don't have scientific evidence. We don't have extra biblical textual evidence. This is a mythological story. Right. <laughs> and um, I really do think that one of the things that we should also recognize, and this is what I heard you say, uh, Brother Michael, a moment ago, mm -hmm. is that this entire narrative celebrates the murder of African children. Mm -hmm. yep. We have to recognize that this is a mythological story. If you want to try to take some of the moral lessons from the story of a group of people who do great battle against a great power and what they must do, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you all day, Brother Michael. Mm -hmm. But when you try to make this a historical narrative, and you're talking about evil African rulers and murdered African innocents, you're going to have to run into me, an African historian, mm -hmm. um, for its veracity. And that's the challenge that I, I think that we have. And it right. sounds like you and I have been ringing the same bell <laughs> right. for a while. And, and you know, it, it's one that means, you know, there are folks that, that, that get death threats for saying the things that we just said. I know I've gotten that. <laughs> and, and, and the reality is all we're trying to do right. is accurately describe the history of ancient Africa. That's all we're trying to do. And, and, and get and people to think. If you want to be a Christian, I'm not saying don't be a Christian. I'm saying think. Okay? That's right. We, we, we that's have to right. separate right. mythology that's from world history. Religious literature, it, see, that's world right. history and religious literature are not the same thing. It was confusing to many people, Brother Jabari, that don't study history, is they hear about uh, events that are supposed to have taken place in in countries or regions that actually is, exist egypt israel you know mm -hmm. things like this okay so mm -hmm. they say okay i can find that on the map mm -hmm. okay so they think that okay everything that's stacked on top of that story must be true it's like wait a second hold on you know it's that's just right. it's just like uh that's it's, right. it's just like that's the right. story uh, story of genesis and genesis and they talk about uh adam and eve being forbidden to eat from the tree of knowledge because you would become likened unto a God. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a second, when you understand African history and culture and spirituality, you're supposed to raise your conscious level to open to re, to understand the power of God that exists inside of you. You're supposed to obtain knowledge. That's right, brother. 
You're supposed to eat from that's the tree right. of knowledge, that's not right. the tree that of you, stupidity. You are the divine vessel. Yeah, that's we're right. God having a that's human right. experience. That comes from African cosmology. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, brother, mm -hmm. we're running mm -hmm. out of time mm -hmm. here. We only got a couple minutes left. Go ahead and let people know how they can get in contact with you. How they, I know you do consulting, different things like that. Give give people your website, yeah. social media, all of that information. That's right. That's right. Well, there are lots of ways for you to get in touch with me. Um, I'm the chief priest of the Shrine of Ma'at. Okay. So if you go to Shrine of Ma'at, Ma'at spelled M-A-A-T, um, Shrine of Ma'at dot org, you'll, you'll get access to me. Okay. Um, Shrine, Shrine of, of Ma'at dot org. Give us the website. Give us the website. Dot org. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that, that's dot org. Okay. And um, for my lectures and my courses, you can get access to those to Center for Ma'at. Ma'at being spelled M-A-A-T as in Tom. Um, and so when you do the, when you go to those places, you'll get access to me. But I'm going to say to you, I am honored to speak to a powerful brother out of <laughs> Motor City. Yeah. I'm coming to Motor City yes, April brother. 30th and May 1st for the One Africa Conference. Yep. So if you really want to connect, that's one of the best ways to do so. Come to the conference. Come if you can't conference. be there, yep. make sure that you are Live watching stream. the stream. Exactly. Um, go and to hoppyfilm.com and you're going to mm -hmm. get access. Well, well, we have it, we have it at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We, we have it at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. It's on our website with the link. We posted the link here also. You can go to hoppyfilm.com, but go to AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information right on the home page all right brother i'll see you here in detroit i'll be there i'll have a vendor booth i think i may be on one of the panels also but i'll see you. we're gonna have a good time man we can talk then do a couple of interviews too hey, brother <laughs> i can't wait to see you brother all right we'll talk soon all right brother hotel peace all thanks right, for coming now. on tonight peace. all right peace okay everybody that is uh brother jabari osazi powerful brother brilliant uh brilliant historian okay those watching on facebook and youtube keep watching Follow us on our fan page, The African History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Turn on live, live notifications so you know when we go live. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. We're going to keep broadcasting for a few more minutes. We're out of time here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF, but that don't stop the show. We're going to keep going because I have another topic that I want to deal with, this federal judge dealing with the um, ending the mass mandate from the CDC. This is a federal judge who was an associate attorney who has never tried a case. This was a judge nominated by Donald Trump, 33 years old woman, 33 old white woman, a lifetime appointment, and she's making the decision that impacts millions of people. Uh, right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you uh, tomorrow. I'll be on Roller Martin Unfiltered on Friday. We'll have the information on our website about that. And then uh, our Sunday show, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we should have Dr. Linda Jeffries, Professor James Small, and uh, some other stuff going on. We'll talk to you uh, next time. Peace. All right. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. Okay. Uh, if you like this type of information, everybody, uh, you can support the African History Network. It supports the research, supports what we do. Uh, even though I'm on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF, I don't get paid. They don't pay me to do radio. OK, they just don't charge me uh, airtime, but I don't get paid. So I have to finance all this stuff. OK, so uh, we're celebrating our 12th year anniversary of me broadcasting the African History Network show. This is one of the reasons why I had to figure out a way to uh, contact um, Cash App, because I've been dealing with these fake um, African History Network Cash App accounts for about six months now. OK, and I've finally been able to really make contact with somebody uh, at Cash App and we've been corresponding through email and they've launched an investigation. They finally understood what I'm what I've been saying. OK, um, and then also you can register for our uh, 10 week online course that we have. Uh, we have a new uh, section of it starting up on Saturday, April 23rd, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school so we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place this class is on sale 80 dollars regularly 130 dollars i do a powerpoint presentation we have book references articles video clips it's very visual you're going to learn a ton of information i have it's over 50 articles that i have in the class this is a big binder that i use for the class and there's book references all this stuff you don't have to buy any of the books um 
to follow along in, in class but we, we have a ton of information to share with you okay i'm gonna post the link again here you can use this information with your children uh as well and then we also have a bundle pack where you get three of my online courses uh for 120 dollars. that's a 260 dollars value you get uh ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade you'll get um from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power 1865 to 1968 that class we deal with history from 1803 through 1968 we start with the louisiana purchase of 1803 and uh we talk some about the haitian revolution and we deal with history chronologically through uh the to see uh what leads to the war uh to the civil war taking place we deal with reconstruction 1865 1877 jim crow era uh world war one world war ii great migration 1915 1970 civil rights movement black power movement okay that's going to start up sunday may 8th um and as soon as you register for that this bonus content you can start watching uh and then uh that one to be 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time and then also you'll get in the bundle pack great african women in history the mothers of civilization we have a couple more sessions that i'm adding to this course here also great african women the mothers of civilization that where we deal with some well-known and not so well-known african women in our history so if you go to our website africanhistorynetwork.com right here for the link it has it for the bundle pack uh it's on sale 120 dollars that's a 200 was that was more to see it's uh it's like a 285 dollar value actually because i threw in a, a third course okay if you've taken any of my online classes in the past email me at ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com you get a 50 percent discount on the courses okay if you're taking any of my online classes i've been teaching the online classes since, since 2017 you're taking them anytime email me at ahn show you get a 50 percent discount okay i want to go to this uh next story here and uh, i wanted to talk about it a couple of nights ago but um we've been so busy and we've had so many interviews um i didn't get a chance to get to this one here okay so there's a uh article from uh there, there was one article that i saw from uh new york times and um also there's one from uh nbc news let me see the one from nbc news is uh this one here let's pull this up and there's a clip i want to go to also okay justice department appeals ruling lifting transit mask mandate after a uh, cdc request okay justice justice department appeals ruling lifting transit mask mandate after cdc request the cdc set center for disease uh center for uh disease control um said on wednesday at this time an order requiring making the indoor transportation corridor remains necessary for the public health at this time an order requiring masking in the indoor transportation corridor remains necessary for the public health now this is an example of how elections have consequences and what happens when you have a simple simon ass person like donald trump as president because the federal judge who made this ruling that puts the lives of millions of people in jeopardy was nominated by dumbass donald trump and she's a member of the federalist society okay so this is what i was warning people about in 2016 leading up to the election and people thought it was just about a, 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 an election between one person and another person no it's not no the, the, the trump supporters said this is about the supreme court they said this is a election is about the supreme court and the federal bench and donald trump got 226 federal judges uh confirmed which is a lifetime appointment all right and i want to pull up this other article here from the uh new york times we have uh the live updates from uh the new york times also i want to pull this up as well all right let's look at this here
So the Department of Justice um, has moved to appeal a ruling that struck down the federal mask mandates, federal mask mandate on planes, trains, and transit systems after a request by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. The CDC said in a statement on Wednesday that at this time, an order requiring masking in the indoor transportation corridor remains necessary for the public health health adding that it has asked the justice department to proceed with an appeal now because of that ruling then uber and lyft put out a memo saying that it's up to the passenger and the driver whether they wear masks or not and you in an enclosed environment the Justice Department said that at the same time, the uh, BA2 uh, variant of the coronavirus is spreading and it's about 25 to 30% more transmissible. Now, it's not, it, it appears that it's not deadlier than Omicron virus, but it transmits about 25% to 30% easier. And, and now we're seeing uh, nationwide, we're seeing uh, coronavirus cases tick up we're seeing coronavirus cases in, increase before this idiot made this ruling the justice department said it has filed a notice of appeal in light of today's assessment by the cdc in a statement late wednesday afternoon wednesday uh, april 20th okay the justice department has not asked the appeals court to block the judge's order that the federal mask mandate on transit systems meaning passengers will be able to continue traveling maskless while the decision is litigated. On Monday, U.S. District Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell for the Middle District of Florida, there's a whole lot of crazy things going on in Florida. Governor Ron DeSatan needs to be voted out of office, okay? And then they just, and, and then they just dismantled a black uh, district in uh, uh, Florida as well, on top of all this other stuff, on, on top of the woke bill, on top of going after Disney, on top of all this stuff, they just dismantled a uh, uh, a black uh, congressional district uh, also in Florida as well. And, 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 and Ron DeSantis wants to run for president. This is why I told people in Florida in, uh, uh, it was in 2018, when Andrew Gillum was running, I said, dude, you got to vote for Andrew Gillum in Florida. And it was some it was some woke ass people who said, oh, Andrew Gillum doesn't have a black agenda. But Ron DeSantis has a black agenda. He has an anti-black agenda. And an anti-black agenda is worse than not having a black agenda. Ron DeSantis has an anti-black agenda. And people were so busy trying to be woke, they didn't realize it. They didn't see it. I was warning them about Ron DeSantis then. So on Monday, U.S. District Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell, who was nominated to the federal bench by Donald Trump, ruled that the travel mask mandate was unlawful, arguing that the CDC has overstepped its legal authority by imposing the mandate in February 2021. The mandate, which was rolled out to combat COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, had recently been extended to May 3rd before it was struck down okay have been recently extended to may 3rd before it was struck down now the justice department announced earlier this week that it would appeal the ruling if the cdc decides that masks are still required on public transportation quote as we have said before Wearing masks is most beneficial in crowded or poorly ventilated locations, such as the transportation corridor. When people wear a well-fitting mask or respirator, like a KN95 mask or respirator, over their nose and mouth in indoor travel or public transportation settings, they protect themselves and those around them, including those who are immunocompromised, or not yet that or that or not yet vaccine eligible and help keep travel and public transportation safer for everyone 
Now numbers were already ticking up because of the new variant. Now you're going to see you're going to see a big increase and also with people traveling anytime you come off of a holiday so people are traveling for the Easter holiday. Anytime you come off of a holiday, okay, and, and it's a big holiday and people are traveling, flying, things like this, we always see an uptick in new cases about probably about two weeks up uh, a week to two weeks after that uh travel and then also you have uh this is right around the time of spring break as well so because of the ruling the white house said the transportation security administration tsa will no longer enforce masks on public transportation and in transportation hubs several airlines including united delta and american have since have since issued statements saying masks are now optional white house press secretary jen saki told reporters during a news conference wednesday that the biden administration is quote deferring to the cdc on what they believe is needed at this point okay the agency the cdc extended the mandate quote because they felt they needed to take a look at the data given that we've seen a rise in cases uh jen saki said noting that the justice department had signaled it would appeal the judge's decision in an effort to empower the cdc during the public health crisis okay now this is a clip that i want to go to now this first clip let me see here we've got uh uh, there was one from the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. There's a couple of clips I'm going to squeeze in here. Um, okay, that's from that's. Uh, let's go to this one here from. Let's go to this one here from April ninth, April eighteenth, uh, NBC Nightly News. This was Monday, okay, because it was Monday that this ruling came down. So let me cue this up here. And then I want to play a clip from uh, the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell because he dealt with this uh, on his show also. OK, now. Um, the agent, the agency extended the mandate because they felt uh, because they felt they needed to take a look at the data, given that we've seen a rise in cases. Jen Psaki said, noting that the, the Justice Department had signaled it would appeal the judge's decision in an effort to empower the CDC during the public health crisis. Quote, we want to preserve the authority for the CDC to have in the future. So check out this article here from uh, NB.com. Justice Department appeals ruling lifting uh, the mask mandate. Okay. Now, if we look at this... Um, if we look at these updates here from, I want to go to this here from uh, New York Times. And, okay, I want to start this at the beginning. Okay. Uh, if we look at this here from the New York Times, uh the live updates let's go to this one here okay a federal judge struck down the mass mandate for planes and public transit the nation's largest airlines dropped the the nation's largest airlines dropped the uh requirement within hours of the ruling but new york's mta said it's a uh, mass mass transit authority said its passengers must still wear a mask for now so there's been and there's also been confusion at airports dealing with also uh city uh mandates as well well if we look at this very quickly here uh federal judge struck down the mass mandate for planes and public transit uh the federal judge in florida struck down the uh, mask requirements on planes, trains, buses, and other transportation on Monday, less than a week after the Centers for Disease Control and, Pre and Prevention had extended it through May 3rd, through May 3rd, okay? So like two more weeks. The ruling left it 
up to individual airline and local transit agencies to decide what to do. And by late Monday, the nation's largest airlines had dropped their mask requirements for domestic flights. Now, keep in mind, just a couple months ago, you had uh, a lot of cancellations of flights. Two or three months ago, you had a lot of cancellations of flights. And some of the airlines are still short employees because they've been out sick with COVID-19 or they quit because of the stresses of working in the airlines industry, uh, dealing with COVID, people caught COVID, decided to quit, things like this. Now you're going to remove the mask mandate. And a lot, and, and a lot, of, a lot of the airlines are already short staffed. The Amtrak rail system said passengers and employees would no longer need to wear masks. In the 59-page decision, decision, U.S. Federal Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell, U.S. District Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell, who was appointed by Benedict Donald, the traitor-in-chief, dumbass Donald Trump, voted the mandate, avoided the mandate, which also applies to airports train stations and other transportation hubs nationwide on several grounds including the agency exceeded its legal authority under the public health services act of 1944 the public health services act of 1944 because of the ruling the masking order was not in effect for the time being and, and TSA would not enforce it, a Biden administration official said on Monday evening, okay? So TSA is not enforcing the mask mandate. Uh, I want to go to this clip here from uh, NBC Nightly News. Let's go to this. This is from uh, Monday, uh, April 18th. Hold on. That the government cannot enforce the mask at home news about the future of those mask mandates a federal judge in florida ruled that the government cannot enforce the mask mandate on planes and other public transit ending a rule that's been in place for 14 months and already some airlines are dropping their mask requirements on board let's bring in pete williams pete what did the judge say well, this came in a lawsuit filed by a conservative group and two women who said wearing a face mask caused them anxiety and panic attacks. The judge said the CDC did not have the legal authority to impose the mask mandate and that the government broke the law by doing it without first seeking public comment. Federal Judge Catherine Kimball Mizell, a Trump appointee, said she had to make her ruling apply nationwide, writing, how is the ride-sharing driver, flight attendant, or bus driver to know that somebody is a plaintiff to this lawsuit with permission to enter mask free so she struck the mandate down lester so what is the immediate effect pete for someone that's going to catch a train right now or heading to the airport well the mandate tonight is all but dead the administration says it's considering its options but tsa is notifying airlines and other mass transit systems that it is not now in effect and at least two airlines are saying tonight that they will no longer require face masks the current mandate was to expire in two weeks anyway. Even so, CDC still recommends wearing one in crowded places. Okay. Yeah, it's common sense. You definitely wear one in, 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 in uh, crowded places. Problem is, a lot of people don't have common sense. Okay, now I want to go to this uh, other clip here. This is from um, The Last Word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Trump as a federal judge, CDC mask rule nixed by Trump picked judge. Okay. Um, and let's just queue up this. Um, they got to play this ad. All right, stand by. Let me cue this ad, but. Okay, let's go to this uh, clip here. And Lawrence O'Donnell is speaking with uh, former U.S. Senator Claire McCaskill, Democrat from Missouri, and also Eugene Robinson, who's an opinion writer 
for the uh, Washington Post. Let's go to the second clip. Senator McCaskill, uh, a 33-year-old nominee to the federal bench who never set foot in a courtroom as a lawyer, uh, suddenly becomes a public health expert today and no more masks required on uh, on most airlines. Um, some airlines have the right to maintain that rule if they want to. Uh, and we all personally have the right to wear masks as I will be on any future uh, airline flights, just when I was getting used to going back uh, to the airport. Uh, this shows you once again the importance of being having that power to appoint federal judges. Yeah, elections really do matter. Uh, they matter in big ways and small ways. And I think the qualification that this very young woman had was that the same year she graduated from law school, which was a near eight years before she was given a lifetime appointment to the federal bench, she also joined the Federalist Society. So she was young, she was Federalist Society, therefore uh, she could become a judge. And I was startled by the language in this opinion, where without sourcing, she makes these pronouncements about the good that masks do or don't do, when she obviously is clueless, and the vast majority of scientific evidence is masks have saved millions of lives in, over the last two and a half years. Gene Robinson, this is basically Donald Trump as a federal judge today. Yeah, it, it absolutely reads like Donald Trump as a federal judge, just, just making these uh, sometimes non sequitur pronouncements that are not based on any discernible fact or not referenced, no facts referenced, at least, uh, in making these conclusions. And, you know, as, as you said, elections matter, only the 2020 election the Republican Party decided it didn't matter, right? And and so even though Donald Trump had lost and was trying to illegally, unconstitutionally, to overturn the result, his party went ahead and on a party line vote confirmed a judge he had nominated who was rated not qualified. Um, and I wonder, I mean, Claire could tell me, but I, I really wonder if that would have happened uh, in the before times. Um, when there was um, some order and stability to our political system. Okay, so that that's from uh, that's a clip from uh, the last word MSNBC uh, Monday, April eighteenth. She uh, so U.S. District Judge Catherine Kimball, who's thirty three years old, federal judge, lifetime appointment. Okay, and and Donald Trump, with the help of Mitch McConnell, who was Senate Majority Leader reshaped the federal bench trump got uh one quarter of the federal judges confirmed he got 226 federal judges confirmed so she was deemed unfit to be a federal judge by the uh, american bar association and uh mcconnell and the republicans in the senate confirmed confirmed her anyway and the Heritage Foundation and the Federalist Society uh, were given Trump lists of ultra conservative, young, largely white male judges to choose from to nominate for for the federal bench and also for the Supreme Court. And people thought the 2016 election was about one person versus another person. Do you, do you realize that? Okay. So Clarence Thomas is still on the Supreme court F judge federal judges and Supreme court judges outlive or th their tenure goes far beyond the president that nominated them. It was uh, George H W Bush, the father who nominated Clarence Thomas in 1992. Clarence Thomas was nominated in 1992 by George H.W. Bush. George H.W. Bush is dead. Clarence Thomas is still on the bench. Like 30 years later. So many of our people don't understand the importance of federal judges in the U.S. Supreme Court because the judicial branch of the federal government interprets law from the legislative branch of the federal government and interprets law and, and interprets 
uh, executive orders from the executive branch of the federal government. The judicial branch of the federal government can strike down laws or uphold laws based upon the fact of whether it is constitutional or unconstitutional. So we, many of us don't understand the importance of the, the judicial branch of the federal government, especially the federal judges, federal, federal courts, federal court of appeals and U.S. Supreme Court. OK, now this. Uh, this next clip here, this is. Uh, this is from. Tuesday, April 20th. This one is uh, Justice Department to appeal after travel mask mandate overturned. This is from NBC Nightly News. Okay, let's go to this one here. Okay, we got to get past this ad. Okay, stand by. And then, um, okay, I want to go back to this article here from the uh, New York Times. Name of this article from the New York Times is uh, a federal judge struck down the mask mandate for planes and public transit. All right, now it is, let me see here if uh, there's something I want to go to. Okay, so still governments and businesses across the nation have largely loosened precautions and now new known coronavirus cases are sharply rising again, sharply rising again. When the CDC extended its mask rule last week, it cited a desire to assess the potential severity of the Omicron subvariant known as BA2, which recently became the dominant version among new U.S. cases. On Monday, April 18th, 2022, the city of Philadelphia reinstated a mass mandate in response, becoming the first major city to do so. President Joe Biden had called on the CDC to impose the mass mandate for others shortly after his inauguration inauguration and the agency did so starting on february 2nd 2021 it extended that mandate several times in july 2021 the health freedom defense fund a wyoming-based advocacy group filed a lawsuit challenging the legality of the mandate in a statement the group called the ruling a victory for basic American liberty and the rule of law. No, it's not. Because these are some of the same people trying to, uh, these are some of the same people who uh, are probably trying to pa pass voter restriction bills as well. And um, so the, all, all these people are connected together. Um Okay, more nonsense. In her ruling, Judge Mizell adopted a narrow interpretation of the authority Congress granted to the CDC to issue rules aimed at preventing the interstate spread of communicable diseases. The law says the agency may take such measures as it deems necessary and provides a list of examples like sanitation the judge judge catherine kimball mizell wrote that this power was limited to things like cleaning property this is what this fool wrote who who the american bar association said was unfit to be a federal judge and the grim Re the grim reaper mitch mcconnell and the traitors Republicans in the Senate voted to confirm her anyway to a lifetime appointment as a federal judge. This dumbass wrote that this power, okay, was limited to things like cleaning property, not requiring people to take hygienic steps. Quote, if Congress intended this definition, the power bestowed on the CDC would be would be breathtaking, she wrote. This is this this fool has never tried a case before. And these dumbasses confirmed her anyway. 
but then gave Katanji Brown Jackson hell, who's more qualified than anybody on the federal bench and any of these goddamn uh, uh, Republican uh, Republicans in the Senate who are attorneys like punk as uh, Ted Cruz, who went to Harvard with Katanji Brown Jackson. She's more qualified than any of them. And, and this is who Republicans put on the federal bench. This chick who's never tried a case as an attorney before. She's a federal judge with a lifetime appointment. And it certainly would not be limited to modest measures of sanitation like masks, end quote. All right, read the rest of this. Okay. This is what I was warning people about in 2016. Why you have to read the U.S. Constitution and understand the three branches of the federal government. And the power of the judicial branch. People focus on the president. Clarence Thomas was nominated, was, was nominated in 1992. George H.W. Bush is dead. Clarence Thomas is still ruling on cases. That's a lifetime appointment. All right. Uh, I'll be on Roller Martin Unfiltered on Friday, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, watch on Roland S. Martin on Facebook and YouTube. Download the uh black star media app you can watch there as well support the african history network give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like on this broadcast support the african history network dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show this helps us keep doing the research pay the bills stay on the air keep broadcasting all right. Um, and then you can uh, register for uh, my online history class we have starting up on uh, Saturday, um, April 23rd, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Class number one uh, starts up ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So we do a thousands of years of history. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. So over 50 video clips, uh, it was over 50 uh, articles we reference in the class. You don't have to buy any of the books, anything like that. Uh, there are excerpts I'll show you from the books. The class is on sale $80, regularly $130. Okay. We have bonus content that you can start watching as soon as, as, soon as you register. You can watch from around the world. There's bonus content you can start watching. You don't have to worry about being in class live, okay? We we all the set we do the sessions live, but we archive all of them. So they're all we record all the live sessions. They're archived. You can go back and watch them anytime. You still have access to the full class even after the course is over with. So a year from now, two years from now, if you want to go back and watch the entire ten weeks, you can do that. Okay, it's not a problem at all. All right, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. We also deal with the African presence in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years as well. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, you focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever.